Thursday morning, we're looking at one of the top uh, business stories in the, the world of football with Tesco Mobile for Business. Simon, alongside me here. It's quite incredible. Time flies, doesn't it? It's almost a year to the day that at Everton, Farhad Mashiri agreed a deal with 777 Partners to buy the football club. And representing 777 Partners was one Josh Wander, who I bumped into briefly in London and who told me then, yeah, this thing's on. I can't tell them anything yet because the Premier League has, uh, has suggested that we don't litigate this in the public. Um, it's prudent for us not to speak, but once the deal is approved, I'm happy to speak to you. And are you confident it will be approved? I am. Didn't happen. So from 777 to Dan Friedkin to Crystal Palace shareholder John Texter, is it going to be third time lucky for Farhad Mashiri and Everton? Now, Texter has been speaking. He spoke to Sky Sports News and he talked about the offers that he's had for his Palace shares and where that leaves him regards his Everton takeover. We have two that have made uh, what we believe are good qualifying bids and we also still have the possibility that our partners may want it. Um, they love the club, you know, as much as I do. And we are now down at the final, you know, week or two of you know, believing we know who the buyer is going to be. Um, and the contract I have with Farhad, you know, gives us a lot of time for that. There's a long stop date of like November 30th uh, that was set to make sure that, you know, we can, I mean, God forbid we can't complete it by then. Uh, and I do believe we can compete it before the, complete it before then. So Simon, it begs a question and it's one I've put to you in the past. Is it still the case? that the best and most legitimate takeovers are the ones you don't hear about in the media until they are done. Well, that's that's a, a very true uh, analysis, but it's not relevant to the society that we now live in and the nature of the Premier League and the nature of this particular conversation around Everton because Everton has been in play because his owner put it in play. The owner put the fact that the football club was up for sale in play. And then you've got all the other aspects of Everton's travails over the last 12 months from point sanctions to all manner of stuff that have found its way into the public domain. And so with that, it's a rather unique situation. And I think the world has turned from the idea that you can suppress. You're buying, if you're buying a championship football club or a League One football club, then the level of interest and intrigue and investigation and interrogation that's, that's detailed on those sort of purchases is not very high. A Premier League football club in a global league that's significant in sport around the world is not going to be able to travel beneath the radar as once deals were. Whether people that are buying football clubs that aren't in a position of influence should be talking about it is a different matter. Mm. John Texter is a different animal. His ability to complete this deal is probably undoubtable because he won't have a problem passing fit and proper person's test because he's already been a director, a significant shareholder in a Premier League football club. His only challenge is that he cannot retain that shareholding in Crystal Palace at the same time as owning a shareholding, a controlling influence in Everton. If he divests himself of that particular challenge, which he says he's about to do, and he, he's the, he is the captain of his own ship on that because he can charge what price he wants and he can do, reduce his price for his shares. So if he sells his shareholding in, in Crystal Palace, he will be a shoe in to walk into into Everton by November the thirtieth. What what is the what what would be the barrier to entry if he's agreed to deal with Mashiri? If if the Premier League have any concerns about him, they wouldn't have allowed him through the door at Crystal Palace. Mm. So he's probably an easy walk through the door. And the most interesting thing about all of this is that Texter says, and this is the most interesting thing for Everton fans. Fans should know that Everton are pretty well off right now and have some good cash to support themselves. Now, that's a very different story than the story that's been trotted out by the so-called experts that analyse people's financial affairs about how desperate Everton's need is. Um, now, that might well be that they've got some money in from the Premier League now and it'll carry them for a few months. But it's a pretty significant statement to add to the to the mix that Everton yeah, yeah. are yeah. pretty well off right now because it's not the sort of terminology you'd imagine being thrown around at Everton where they can't seemingly... Uh, get themselves together economically. I've, I've got an owner that doesn't seem to have any will or financial wherewithal to want to stay at Everton anymore. Right. All that leads you to the conclusion that the last thing you'd think they'd have is the expression being put in their direction of pretty well off right now. Right, OK. By comparison, maybe, to what they might have been previously. So if that raises an eyebrow <coughs> when he says something like this, uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the, the quote you've just given me, what does this tell us about Texter? He says, if you decide football is what you want in your life, 
and then somebody comes along and asks you if you want to become the owner of Everton. It's like someone asking you if you want to be president of the United States. Of course you do. Really, John? Well, it says he's prone to hyperbole. It says he's a showman. <laughs> um, it says that ultimately he's playing to the gallery. Yeah. Um, and that Everton... I mean, this professed love... I mean, I don't know. I loved Crystal Palace because I grew up next door to them. Mm. My father, as a young man, played in their youth setup and, and, and near to their first team. And I grew up watching this club all my life. So to such a point, I wanted to buy it. John Texter bought Crystal Palace as an investment. So when I hear Americans parachuting in with their love of something, um, it kind of makes it brings out a wry smile in me. What they love is the success and the commercial opportunity that it may bring for them. And if they can get some affection into the club, then of course they will respect yeah. the values of the football club. But ultimately, Texter is well-versed mm. in how to own football clubs. And whether his vehicle that he wants to buy Everton with is going to be debt-laden or cash-rich, if it's debt-laden, I don't see how Everton's position get much better. Is he well-versed, though, Simon? And, and I ask that in the light of what we heard when he started talking about club accounts at Lyon, the other club that he has a big interest in. Uh, Lyon, of course, in Ligue 1 in France. Now, when you speak to me about figures, Simon, I am no expert, but I try and keep up with you and you spell it out. You spell it out to me. This was Texter presenting the club accounts to the media at Lyon. I think if I just do the math on that, we bought 145 million euros of players. We sold only 40. We have, I guess that means a 95, uh, 95 million sort of net purchase number. Um, and our original, original plan was to have an 80 million net purchase number. It's not a huge change to our budget. Instead of being net negative, a hundred and no net negative one hundred and ten, we're negative uh, ninety five. Yeah. 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 No, our plan was negative eighty. We ended up negative uh, ninety five. No, that's what I wrote down. But I think that's a mistake. Um, anyway, we uh, we saw. <laughs> Sorry, we sold 140. We bought 145 in this window. We sold 40, right? So there's your negative outflow of uh, actually that's 105, right? Yeah, you get the point. You're talking about a 20 million swing. You're not talking about a 100 million swing. Ah, right. Okay, kind of with you now, John. Unfortunately for him, that was in front of the media. And that clip went viral last night. Yeah, I know. But I mean, the guy's not a, a very, I mean, the guy's a billionaire. <laughs> And everybody makes mistakes. And if, he, if he's not paying attention to a particular set of scenarios and it's 95 rather than 105, no, it's not a great look and you can ridicule it. But the fact the guy's in a position where he's talking about numbers that most people won't even, certainly not journalists, will never earn in 57 lifetimes. All right, and you okay, can we get that. it, we get it. Yeah, but it's true. I mean, ultimately, people misspeak. It wasn't the journalists who were talking. It was no, but the fact it goes viral and the fact it will be ridiculed by people that wouldn't have the faintest idea what that kind of scale of money involves and the fact that he misspoke, so what? Mm. The guy's in a position where he owns enormous businesses. You'd expect him not wealth. to get into a cul-de-sac like that, though. Well, he just added up something wrong. wrong. Mm. He added up something wrong. Yeah. I, I don't think... I mean, if you asked him what the financial affairs of Leon was, what his financing arrangements of it were, what the balance sheet said, he simply turned around and said it was 95 million rather than 105 million. I think it's nothing. I mean, I, I would like to think that he would think that I would rather have not said that. And you're in front of a media, you're thinking about a variety of other things, you're thinking about what facetious uh, well it didn't sound like it did it not well look what the difference between I mean the difference between the journalists uh, were quite quiet in that clip weren't they well they would be yeah because they're sitting there waiting it, it, we're, they were just letting him get into a knot himself. yeah but we're judging it yeah you're judging it and I'm saying nothing to see here the guy turned mm. around and said it's a, what we're saying is someone that's more successful than the entire contents of this floor right, has made a, a, a numerical error and mm. we're going to turn around and suggest that he doesn't know what he's doing. Owner's union, isn't it? No, it's just an unrealistic... Come on, he was in a cul-de-sac and yeah, he, he took himself into it. Yeah, he's it. silly. He should, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem very difficult because yeah. as soon as someone says 145 and you've spent 40, it doesn't seem like a difficult equation to go... That's 105 net spend. That's 25 million difference from what we said. It doesn't oh, I got seem. That. I got that. It doesn't yeah. seem very difficult. 
But the fact that the man has achieved, achieved remarkable things in commerce... Of course, of course. ...must lend you to the conclusion that he possibly knows what he's doing. Do you think he gets Everton? Um, Does he get control? Well, look, who knows? I mean, we've seen so many different people dance this dance. We've seen my friend George Downing being in there with an opportunity to do it, and then ultimately Friedkin took that situation out. Friedkin was going to do it. He's now the debt in Everton. The big thing for Everton is the structuring of debt yeah. and the cost implications of it. Texter seems committed. If he's selling his shareholding at Crystal Palace, then one would think that it leads to the, con the conclusion that Everton is the club that he's going to buy. But you know, but the 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 notion that he talks about Everton in the way that he does, comparing it to the presidency of the United States, I think is a load of old tosh. Yeah, um, it's a bit silly, isn't it? What well, we heard a load of old tosh from the former president this week. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.